why our minute, we started by talking about why all, everything that happens in the name of the church, everything, needs to have the gospel as its motivation and as its goal, making the gospel known and helping to make Jesus worshipped and famous all over the earth. Everything, everything we do as a church, if, if, we're, if we're operating outside of that paradigm, I think we're wasting our time because there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So we talked about the Sunday gathering, the importance of the, the church gathered, and w what we need to do with our time there. I'm, I'm really excited to look at, your, at the liturgies you guys build. I, I'm excited for how they'll be different, honestly. Uh, not just from each other, but from how I would build one. I'm, I really am. That'll be a lot of fun to look at. Um, and just as a reminder with that, if there's a speaking part from up front, please manuscript that out. I'd love to see exactly what words you would have someone, you would have someone come up and say. Um, we talked about, um, well, we just finished talking, talking about evangelism, but first we talked about discipleship and our need for ongoing sanctification and how the testimony of the New Testament is clear. We don't do that alone. We need help doing that. And so if we need help doing that, what can that look like in a, in the, in a church in a way that, again, makes the gospel the point? But we're, we're, we're not pursuing traditionalism, we're not just pursuing um, morality for the sake of morality. We want to look more like Jesus. We want to be more like Jesus. One day we will be glorified, but we pray today your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we, we, get, we, get, a jump, we get a jump start on heaven in a way in that regard as we witness for Christ to the world. And we talked about um, evangelism, um, helping to see people be transferred from darkness to light. Um, and enter into God's uh, family and submit themselves to his rule and bend the knee in repentance. And, um, there's, and as, as we kind of learned, there's not, there are many ways, and even just as I heard your stories, the conversations you had with these people were different. And so much of evangelism, I would say, is discernment for who is this person I'm talking with Asking for God's guidance, even in the moment, Lord, what is the what is the best way to speak to their heart? Understanding that if Romans one is true, they do have a knowledge of God. It may be buried, it may be suppressed, but it's there. He has revealed himself himself to them. So we are going to proclaim uh, the, the lordship of Jesus and our accountability to Him, and we're going to do it courageously, and we are going to do it trusting God with the results. So. With all that said, we do have a few sessions left, and these are kind of, I thought through, they don't necessarily fall under any of those main three categories we've done. They're kind of what, what I would call a grab bag. It's a mixed bag of, of different topics that I think will still be helpful to us as we consider uh, the gospel in our churches. So session 20 is this, equipping others for gospel-centered ministry. Equipping others for gospel-centered ministry. Let me tell you a sad story. Uh, the story I'm creating is hypothetical, it's fake, but, but it, it's, it is real to life. In other words, I've, what I'm about to describe, I've seen this oh, many times. I'm just not giving you a specific example. Um, it's very common, at least in my part of the world, that there is a church that might be doing very well. Uh, from an appearance standpoint, oh, the, the pastor the, is excellent and, and he preaches so well and we have, we have some very talented musicians there. The music is great. We have, we have somebody there who's an excellent evangelist. Um, you know, our, our, women, uh, you know, our women love to serve by, by making food. You know, I have a friend who pastors a church near me they do, they do a meal, they do a potluck every Sunday after church. Everyone moves right into the fellowship hall. There's food. I think that's divine. That's great. I love food. So anyway, but, but if you see a, a church that's doing very well because they have some really talented people, gifted people, good systems in place, here, I've seen this happen. Maybe you have as well. The pastor, who is excellent, people come to hear him preach. The pastor retires one day. Or he gets ill and has to stop. Or, um, or he falls into sin and he's no longer qualified for ministry. Ooh. Well, what happens? Um, 
um, what's the plan? I have seen churches go from being vibrant and impacting their community to becoming totally irrelevant in a matter of months. And the reason is nobody in that church was doing the good work of training up other people. And so you had some talented people, but they were the only ones. Oh, we have a great music team, but it's only those people. What happens when they leave? We have a really great elder who preaches, but ooh, he's the only one who preaches. What happens when he leaves? Or even the details, even the details. Uh, so-and-so used to make it his job to clean, to clean the space every Sunday but he moved away to be closer to family, and now our church meeting space is, is, is trashed every Sunday. I've seen churches uh, totally shut down because they didn't train anybody, they did not raise up new leaders, they did not invest in another, in another generation or in another group, in another group of, of uh, men or, or women, depending on the task, and when those people leave and they're gone, that church doesn't know what to do. They don't know what to do, and um, so they shut their doors, or they sell the building, and the church dissolves, or, or whatever. It's a really sad thing, and so what I want us to hear is that every ministry in, in the church should have what I call a succession plan. Who will, who will succeed me? Who is coming after me? Who can do what I do? And if the answer is nobody, well, what that tells me is that one thing that I need to do, I need to identify a man or men, and I need to train them, and I need to equip them, and I need to help them get to the point where they can do what, what I'm doing in ministry. Somebody please read 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Let's think about these like generations. How many generations are listed here? Hmm? Yep, what you have heard from me, so one, two, me and you, what you have heard from me, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul is painting a picture of men in ministry whose, whose job is not just to carry out my task. I don't just preach on Sunday. I need to be finding other men and teaching them to preach on Sunday. I need to be teaching other men to evangelize. I need to be teaching other people to, to take care of the, the regular, everyday ministries of the church. Um, the kingdom of God did not begin with you. And it will not end with you. you we, we are all one piece in a long chain of ministers. And part of our job is to help make sure that the next generation is ready. And then the next one. And then the next one. So that the church will continue. So that there can be a legacy of gospel presence in, in a town over and over. If, if you drive through uh, very rural parts of Montana... You will see small but very beautiful churches that nobody has met in for years. Because the churches did not raise anybody up to continue ministering there. And now, and now they just sit there. They're empty, uh, they're empty buildings. They're pretty, so some people still come and take pictures of them and they make calendars. They're, they're, you can buy calendars with photos of, every month is a photo of a different old abandoned church in Montana. It's our job to raise up others, to identify them and do it. Paul did it. Part of your ministry is to do it, to identify other men and make sure... You need to work yourself out of a job. That, that's the way I put it. Um, again, I keep using... It's not, it's not the prettiest illustration, but if you get hit by a truck tomorrow, who is going to step in and fill your shoes? 
Well, first of all, if you say, oh, it's not really a big deal because I don't do anything at the church, well, that, that's a different problem. We need to talk about that. But in terms of being in ministry, and as you guys look to pastoral ministry, you always need to be thinking about um, who am I investing in to do this as well. Whether they stay or whether we, the, we multiply and go plant. A church can't plant until, until all of the, you know, the pieces are in place. I, we've been thinking about this lately because we want to plant in the next two years. And so the first thing I told everybody, if you have a job in this church, you need to find somebody and train them. Make sure that there's somebody who can do what you do. Now, this goes for everything. This goes for everything. Pastoring, raising up new elders, um, um, it goes to the deacons. If the deacons are, have a more uh, administrative or service-related job, they should be training up others. Um, down, down to every detail. If you make a list of who is involved in making the ministries of this church happen, down to every little discipleship group, group of three men, even the, the leader of a discipleship group should be thinking, who can lead this when I'm not here? Music team, cleaning the building, everything. This is how multiplication can happen. Not just, not just multiplication, two things. One, uh, uh, potentially multiplication. Yeah, like we get enough people trained up. We're going we're gonna to plant another church. Praise God. That's why we're here. But not even just multiplication, but just continuation of this church, uh, of, of whatever church. Say, I mean, I, let, me, let me draw it very close to home. What if, what if Pastor Michael had to leave the country for some reason? What, what would happen? You know, would there be somebody or not or not just even one person, but a group of men who could step in and say, you know what? We're, I think we're ready. We, we've been invested in. We've learned to shepherd people. We've learned to preach. We've learned to care in these different ways. We've learned to carry out the pastoral functions. You guys are a pretty new church, so I'm not putting that pressure on you. We're, we're, we're five years old and we're just getting to that point. I have a group of I have a group of about seven or eight guys now. Who I'm, who I'm training in pastoral things, about three of them I'm very confident in, and, and the rest are coming along, so this takes time. But that's how we should be thinking for multiplying churches and for just continuing churches. I love it when, I, when, when there's a church that's been around for generations and generations and generations that tells me that that church has been faithful to do this. They've been faithful to be thinking not just about me today, my ministry, what am I doing? They're thinking about, okay, yes, but who comes after me? What about my children and their grandchildren? Who will, who will be here to minister to them in the future generations? Now, multiplication and raising up other people is hard. Multiplication specifically, why is it hard? Why are some people resistant to multiplication, to what I'm talking about? All, in any of it, yeah. The, the, the concept of raising up other people to, to do my job so that we can continue or multiply. What is some resistance you might meet to that? What do you think? Yeah. Yep. Takes a lot of work, different insecurities. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yes, that one is huge. We, we like church just the way it is. We don't want to leave. We don't want to multiply. We don't want things to change. Oh, yeah, yeah, I hear that. I hear that all the time. When we talk about planting a church from Emmaus Road Church, people get nervous. Not everyone. Most people are excited and on board. A lot of people get nervous. They get nervous, and, uh, you know, you want to plant and multiply in a responsible way, but we need, we need to do it. <laughs> and... Uh, so yeah, some people are in their comfort zone, absolutely. People become dependent, you know. Oh, we have all the, we have all the people already involved. They're doing all the work. They can, they're doing all the work. I can, I can come on Sunday and benefit from their hard work. Let's not change anything. <laughs> yeah, that's an attitude sometimes. Some of it is just ignorance. People have never been taught why it is good to multiply churches. Some people have never, they've never thought we think about the Christianity, and we think about the Christian life. We tend to think just about my 80 years on the planet. 
No, 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 no. Back up. Look at the big picture. Somebody started this, starting with the apostles. There have been faithful men who have trained others, who will teach others also. And it's been a continuation. Let's keep that going. We have to keep that going. When you men are all dead, which I hope is a very long time from now, I hope and pray that there are dozens of churches in this city and in this region because of what started right here in this room. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, the fruit we often don't see. We don't see, I think, somebody, I don't know who originally said it, but I, I heard Mark Dever say it at a, at a conference. Most of the seeds we plant will stay under the ground until we are under the ground. Like you, 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 There's so much fruit that will come from your ministries that you will never see, and that's okay. That's okay. You need to live, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten in many ways. But we can create a gospel legacy. But it only happens when we, when we think outside of just myself and my ministry, and I think about, okay, how am I going to, how, what am I going to do to make sure that this can continue uh, for the generation after me and for the season after me? So... Um, let me just say this. We need to find these men. Paul said, what you've heard from me, entr uh, entrust to faithful men. How do we find faithful men? Let me hear from you. How? How do we find them? Death row. Yeah. It's an e yeah, that's an excellent point. Excellent point. I think you're correct. We just need to ask sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I used the uh, expression that my dad run the put the flag up the pole and watch and see who salutes so I, I i say create opportunities for people to serve if if there's just one group of people and they do everything they take care of everything on sunday they take care of all the community groups everything and the people of the church are never given an opportunity to serve well then what do we expect of course we're not going to find anybody you might occasionally have one or two people who come to you and say Hey, can, can I help with that? You might have those people. There are those people. But I, I, we, need, we need to just ask. And I, uh, we need to educate our people, I think, from up front and other ways. Um, give people an opportunity. Tell the church, hey, church, we're, we're constantly doing this. Hey, church, we have a lot of service opportunities in the body of Emmaus Road Church. And I just want to ask all of you to think, think about participating in that, you know. Um, would you please consider helping in this way or on this team or um, in doing these sorts of things? And you, you, just, you might be really surprised who comes forward and says, yeah, yeah, I would do that. Other people, um, I some people, you might disagree with this. I think we call it headhunting. I, I just go ask people. If there's someone who I think would be good at something specifically, I'll just go straight to them, at, like after church. I'll just say, you know, I'll just, I'll, I, it, I don't like try to put pressure on, but I'll just tell you, like, I think you'd be really great in this ministry. Would you, would you please think about doing it and like let me know in the next two weeks? If when you just ask people something face to face, a lot of times, again, you're not trying to pressure them or, or manipulate them, but just for them to know, they just may have no confidence in their own abilities. And it's like, oh, one of the elders thinks I can do that. M maybe I can. Yeah, let's get, you know, get, let's give it a try. I think some people think that if you do any kind of ministry in the church, it's because you have some special, huge, big, divine calling. God, you know, God appeared in a pillar of fire and said, you are equipped for children's ministry, you know, or whatever. And it's like, no, man, the church ministry is just normal people. And a lot of times they just need to be asked. So ask them. You have to observe, yes, you have to observe your people. So here's what that tells me. Um, you think of any famous musician, you know, if, if you're, if a world, if a world famous musician came through your church doors and said, hey, I'm a Christian now, I am not, go I would be a fool if I said, 
we got to get you on the music team. No, no, no. Nope, it'd be, it'd be welcome. I'm glad you're here. Get to know our church. Can't wait to get to know you and observe you. Um, we, need, we need to know our people because there's trust involved. There's confidence involved. You don't want to put just anybody in charge of anything. Um, and it, it, it depends on what you're looking for. I mean, elders, is the, we probably guard the office of elder the closest. We're given the most qualifications for elders. Other things, not as much. Deacons, I guard deacon offices very closely as well. We have a church in Minnesota, the church I was telling you about. There's a, they, they have a very successful um, drug addiction recovery program at their church. Like one third of their church is recovered drug addicts. It's really great. Uh, there's a guy who comes every Sunday. He is not a believer. He listens to the gospel. He has conversations about it. He's not bent the knee to Jesus yet. He runs their entire coffee bar at the church. He's one of the most faithful men in the church. <laughs> now, now we're not going to ask him to be a deacon or an elder. But I would let him serve coffee. You know, he's there. He's faithful. He's hearing the gospel. He's not. He's not. Uh, he's not arguing with us. We think he'll come to faith, but he's not there yet. So that's something you would all have to discern. Would you let an unbeliever uh, uh, be in charge of the coffee even at church? Yeah, that's for you to decide. But I think it's a good story. It just illustrates the point that. Um, you need to think through individual, individual jobs, individual roles, and who, who might be good for them. Because you, you wouldn't put just anybody in any role. That's my point. That's my point. Yeah. How can you ever be totally sure when you're observing somebody? I think this is where, depending on what the, what the job is you're asking them to do as well, that the answer might change. But I think this is where your other elders are helpful. Because I can be observing someone and say, I think... I think they're in a good place to do that. I might just ask my other elder, what, what, what do you think about this? I, I think this person could be great for this. What do you think? He might know something I don't know. Oh, oh no, no, I, I would not put him in charge of that. Oh, why not? Well, don't you know? Oh, okay. So, so what I'm, multiple, multiple observers is helpful because it just creates more integrity. If it's something like a deacon or an elder, we, we use the church body, the membership to, to, we, we, we want them to affirm it. So, like, if we just have a, a guy in our church, Trent, he became an elder candidate, meaning we're, we're, he's moving toward ordination. We want him to become a pastor. But um, we told the church, okay, starting right now, um, we have an open-door policy. We want to hear from you about Trent. What do you observe in his life? Do you, is he a man you could follow? These sorts of things. So we're actually using the entire church to, to affirm that over and we'll, we'll take probably about a year to do it now that's for an elder so that's very specific um you, I, you can't i wouldn't do that for everything like hey we need a, we need a janitor jethro has volunteered to be the janitor so we're going to give him a trial period of one year and we need well, well it depends on the job i guess yes i, I also if it's an, a, a deacon or an elder position i want to observe that man in his home as well I want to see how he interacts with his wife and children. Um, one thing we do for, for Trent, we're going to call his employer. His employer is not a Christian, but scripture says that they need to have a good reputation with unbelievers. Okay, we're going to call his boss and say, tell us about Trent. Is he a good worker? How does he talk when he's at work? You know, these sorts of things. We're going to be as thorough as we can. Yeah. Absolutely. It's never foolproof. There's always a little bit, an element of faith involved when you're, when you're raising men up. Um, so that's an excellent question. But yeah, you give people opportunities to serve and see who steps forward. That's, that's, a, that's how you start to identify these men. Um, and then how do you train them? I, there, I have a, you know, we have systems for training people in different things, you know, whether it's theology training or these other things. Okay, but, it, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking way more basic than, than, than that. Um, if I want to train you in how to do a visit to a, a member is sick in the hospital and I want to train you how to do that, what's the best way? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yep. I'm going to the hospital. Let's go. Come with me. We're going to the bedside together. Come to this funeral sit in on this uh, premarital counseling session. 
write a sermon. Oh, you don't know how? Okay, great. We'll, we'll create a class. This is how you exegete a text and write a sermon. Great, yeah. But just, just bring them with you. Bring them with you. Invite them into your world. If it's, you know, if it's me as a pastor, I'm going to let someone basically shadow me. We, we, um, that, and that's what Trent is doing right now. For, he, comes to all, he doesn't have a voice on the elder board, but he's at every elder's meeting listening. We ask his opinion. Um, but he's basically watching us do what we do. And uh, so that when the time comes, it, it, here's something that is very confusing to me. And I'll be careful about how I say this. It, but it is confusing to me when a church, when someone, gra- a man graduates seminary, a church interviews him for maybe two weeks and then hires him. I just, you don't even know him. You haven't observed him. You have no idea how he'll be interacting with people or at the bedside or, or, or at the funeral. You have no idea. You have no idea. I just, and, and, you know, a lot of independent churches, which is the majority of churches where I live, they're not denominational. They're not affiliated. They're just independent churches. That's what they do. They, uh, they, they take resumes and they do interviews and they hire someone over the course of a couple weeks. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, I, but there's, there's great integrity and there's much more safety in raising people up from within your own ranks rather than, hey, we need a new pastor. We're taking job applications. Sometimes you might need to do that. But um, I, think the, uh, I think the much more natural way is to be raised, like Paul says, be fi- find men who you, can, who you can teach these things to. But yes, you, just, you bring them along. You, I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to show you how to do it. And then you're going to do it with me watching. Okay, and then you got it. You got it. Yeah. And uh, so are we going to say something, James? Well, I was yeah. Ask, is that how elders are usually chosen as far as the leadership? Mm. Is it like the resume style? It, it, it's very congregational, congregational governed. Mm-hmm. We do. That's what we do. We do not put it to a vote. But, but yes. But I think here, it's the way the leaders are chosen. Uh-huh. And then well, some church... Same. Some churches in the states would be congregationally governed, and they, and they would put it to a vote. I yeah. Would say right. Ult- ultimate, they're the high, yeah, in, in true congregationalism, the voting membership of the church is the highest authority in the local church. Okay. Everything you're describing happens in the U.S. as well. The, the churches have different systems for how they would identify and raise up leaders. Um, but what counsel is uh, more appropriate for discipline? Ooh, I can, I can tell you what I think is, is wisest. Yeah. And, I, and I, do, I agree with the way Sovereign Grace does it. That's part of why we join them. Elder-governed churches. So we are identifying and raising up elders and ordaining elders. Now, with that said, though, with that said, if, if I, I keep using the example of Trent, the man in our church, we put him forward as an elder candidate. If after a year, even, even 20% of the church was saying, ah, I don't know. I don't know about Trent yet. I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure he's a man we could follow. If even 20% of the church was saying that, as elders, I think we would be very foolish to say, well, we're the elders, so we're just going to do it anyway. I think we'd be foolish to do that. Um, I think we need, I think elders are very wise. Before we are elders, we are members of the church as well, and we are accountable to the body. That's absolutely true. But we are also, Acts 20, 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 5, we are also called, only the elders are called to exercise oversight of the church. So it is ultimately our decision, um, but if, if we are wise, we will, we will be in touch with the, with the membership enough that we will accurately represent them. And um, now there, there may be a time when people, when and we haven't run into this in our church, we haven't, there may be a time when the elders just need to make a hard decision, even if a significant part of the church is, you know, disagrees with them, if the elders truly believe it's best. That, that, yeah, yeah, again, we haven't run into that, but... Um, I, that's that's where I'm. That's where I'm at. I do. I think that's the wisest way. I, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think congregationally governed churches are in sin. 
I, 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 would, I mean, I wouldn't, want to work, I wouldn't want to do that, but I, but I know that there are some excellent churches that do things differently, and that's okay. I, I, do, I imagine it's hard to get things done. No, you need expectations. You know, you know there is no distinction between pastors and elders. You know, it's a, yeah, it's all the same word. It, yeah. So I don't understand when churches say, well, we have a pastor, and then we have an elder board. Yeah. Oh, yeah, co- common, common in the U.S. as well. Yeah, that, that's a kind of a, yeah, absolutely. James, what were, you have some thoughts. Elders and pastors, are they different? Um, they are, they are, the words are used very interchangeably, and it's the, it's the word from where we get, yeah, shepherd, pastor, even um, overseer, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Bible doesn't give us separate categories for a pastor and an elder. Elder and deacon, yeah, but um, sure. What we would do is, um, like, we're not going to put it to a vote, but what we would do is we, we continue to remind the church, hey, by the way, Trent is still an elder candidate. We would like to hear from you. We, we kind of put it on the church. Like, please come talk to us, either to affirm or to raise concerns about Trent. We, I, I find that if, if I were to, like, you know, send out an email with, like, a form, like, hey, please answer these questions. Do you think Trent is, you know, da 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 da, da. Do you see him doing well? If I do that, it's really easy for someone just to get an email and, yeah, I'll fill this out real quick. And there's safety when, when we're behind a screen. They might say, they might be overly critical or say irresponsible things. We, we actually, we put the burden on the church member. Like, if you have something to tell us, our door is open, but please, you, you need to come tell us. And that way, we only hear serious things, if that makes sense. Like, I don't, I don't want someone filling out on an email. I don't like the way Trent preaches. And, and like, with no other explanation. It's like, well, okay, well, I can't really do anything with that, you know. So I think what we do, we invite, we, like, we do these things face-to-face. And we don't, we don't, here's another thing, Brian, we don't allow people to be anonymous. I'm like, nope, if you have some criticism of Trent, you're going to tell us in person, and we're going to know who you are. We're not going to, we're not going to receive anonymous letters, or any of that, that's garbage. No, don't, ne- never, anonymous letters go straight in the garbage. They go straight in the trash can. Um, if these are members of the church who have something serious to say, then the relationship should be healthy enough with the leadership that they're comfortable enough to come to us and we tell, we will hear you, yeah. We'll sit and hear you, we'll ask you good questions and we'll thank you and we'll take it into consideration. So that, that's, how we, that's how we guard the process. We say, please, if you have anything to contribute about Trent, please, please come and, and talk to us. Um, and that way, if Trent becomes an elder, which I think he will, and somebody says six months later, well, w- well wait a minute, I, I didn't want Trent to be an elder, I'll say, well, we invited you to come talk to us, why didn't you talk to us? So I, 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 I do put the burden more on them. That's how we would do that. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good questions, guys. Good thoughts. Um, bring people with you. And um, again, depending on the situation, the, the c- character always matters. Don't put never, it, it's, I'll tell you this, it's really easy. It's really easy to put someone in a position it's a lot harder to take them out. Um, so you just want to use a lot of caution. You want to be as sure as you can. Um, I personally have been guilty of being too quick to lay on hands before. I have. And I've had to deal with that. We've, we've had to work really hard and really carefully to reverse um, some decisions that we made. So be careful about that. But bring people with you. And when the time is right, hand things over to people if you can. Um, Dep- depends on the office. Uh, it would be it would be different for an elder than it would a volunteer with children's ministry, for example. I mean, it would just it would just just different different standards. We want all of our people to grow in holiness, um, but something like someone moving toward eldership would just take a lot more a lot more time to scrutinize and be intentional. Um, Whereas, so well, the children's ministry, for example, they're going to go through a basic background check. I mean, things are crazy. You just have to be so careful even who you let be alone with your kids. They're going to go through a basic online background check. They're going to go through a uh, safety training for how to keep kids safe and how to protect them and all that. Um, and assuming everything comes back fine and there are no major concerns, we'd, we'd probably, and they're members of the church, we'd probably, we'd probably let them do that.
So it, it just depends on what the actual visit you ministry is. Yeah. Good things to think through. Good thing have these conversations with you know with with um, with Pastor Michael and and uh, yeah. What are the different standards for these things? You don't want just anybody leading music from up front, and it's not just about talent. You know that they should they should be skilled enough that they're not a distraction, but they don't have to be a rock star. And uh, but their, their character matters. When you have people who are leading in any capacity, their character matters tremendously. Just remember that. And um, and we do the best we can with broken people because that's what we all are. We're all sinners. So there's a lot of room for grace. Give people opportunities to grow. And um, but the but the big the big takeaway is always be thinking about who can do my job, who can do my job. How can I identify these other men? 